Recording, recording. I'm going to switch this back over to my laptop. And again, where we left off is uh, talking about lighting, talking about the geometry, uh, talking about the camera. Right? We adjusted a bunch of settings. And um, now I'm going to talk about materials. So, uh, another word for materials if you start to see the word shaders, right? Um, I don't know where that came from. That came from Maya or maybe Studio Max I, uh, or Alias Wavefront Studio Tools. I don't remember. It's been so long. But um, this idea of shaders and materials are the same thing. So if you're Googling, trying to find a particular material for a shader or material, you can always use those, those two terms interchangeably um, in order to sort of see what pops up in the old magical search engine. Um, these are two sites that I found to be incredibly helpful when it comes to this stuff. So you'll find out um, as you start to render, particularly if you're using um, Rhino 7 now, but also like Unreal Engine and some of those others, uh, that they have this, these called basically based, uh, basically based materials, right, PBR architectures. Um, what's interesting about these is that they, they sort of combine the diffusion map and the bump map and the displacement map all together, uh, along with any transparency map. So, it's like all of them smashed together in one sort of three-dimensional material, right? That sort of looks three-dimensional. Again, um, we haven't really talked about shaders. I'm talking about maps, like diffuse maps, color maps, texture maps. But there's also things like um, displacement maps, bump maps, and transparency maps. So what those do is those begin to provide pictures that actually um, tell the render engine to actually physically alter and begin to show, uh, let's say, um, relief textures and patterns, um, or uh, lets you see through each piece of geometry right at the fifth transparency map. So, um, so we'll talk about that in a moment, but just to sort of fill you in, right, this is, this is one of the websites that I've entered in here. If you go to the modules, right, we're in project one still. Rendering, putting it together, that's today. There's an assignment for you to do over the weekend to do by the start of class on Monday. And I've actually added a page called Shader, Scale, Figure, and Entourage Resources. And we'll continue to add to this because you'll see that there's a number of resources that we can start to add and flex, and you'll come across some and hopefully share with me. I can post on here so we can share with everybody. Um, lots of different ways to get free materials, free shaders, free people, free trees, free street furnishings, free patches, you know, all that kind of stuff. So free sky, backgrounds, etc. Um, and so oftentimes you just see me do is just um, like uh, even during classes, pull open my browser, Google something, go to Google Images, set it to very high for you know, whatever outputs I want. Um, I try to find the, the best uh, image with the highest resolution or largest size um, to use in this case, right? So um, we'll be dealing with that stuff next week in particular when we start doing photo fashion and collaging in Photoshop, right? So the idea is over the weekend, you produce a couple of renderings that then become the base renderings that we start to um, collage and build up in Photoshop next week. Okay. So this all builds on, it, on itself, right? All right, great. So um, here's another one. It's called Architectures, right? Material Editor for Architects and Designers. So let me go back, actually, if I, shh. Just kidding, I don't care. Um, if I go to Browse Textures, you can see that it takes me to a page. Um, you can start to see a bunch of results. 5.35 textures in the category of this piece looks like brick masonry. Um, if I go to concrete, you know, there's three textures for concrete, uh, 34 textures for fabric. Um, you know, there's marble, there's, there's paving, gravel, pavers, tiles, walls, wood, etc. Right? Right? So you can always try to download these pop them into that directory where you want to find them, um, and I'll show you how you can begin to pull up your shaders uh, editor in Rhino and start to add them in. That's what we're going to do today. Um, another one is called Architectures. This is, uh, again, these will give you JPEGs, I think. Um, so basically, uh, uh, texture maps. Right? Um, this is useful for if you want to make your own sort of, tech, uh, let's say, mapped material. But what I usually end up doing is using these as overlay layers within Photoshop. So oftentimes, if it comes down to this isn't looking right when I'm rendering it as a shader in the render engine, I'll get rid of it, 
do the rendering, then I'll post produce, I'll add that material, that texture um, uh, in Photoshop afterwards, right? I just don't have time to fuss around with exoteric rendering engine settings that I just, just can't wrap my head around half the time. Um, and so oftentimes, um, you know, I'm not going for complete extreme photorealism anyway, but I try to build up a sort of um, design-based, urban design-based uh, uh, sort of collage um, uh, aesthetic anyway. And so, you know, that helps me sort of build in that aesthetic of sort of creating a collage with lots of different layers and things like that. Um, so anyway, you can begin to find base things like, let's say, uh, let's go with wood. And let's say, you know, I want to Douglas Flair staggered. And then it takes me to, this is inherently a, a, a parametric exercise, the parameters and go to edit. And I can say, you know, do I want a staggered pattern or do I want a chevron pattern or a herringbone pattern or an ashlar pattern or a cubic pattern or a stack pattern, stretcher, whatever. All kinds of schmug deal there. Rows, columns, the scale, the width, the height. Um, I can begin to adjust the color. I can begin to adjust the edge conditions, et cetera, right? And then once you're ready, you can download the JPEG and call it a day. So if I change this, of course, the, I'm going to change this to something I probably would never use, but, you know, whatever. Um, so I can change the density, et cetera, build it on. It starts to build things randomly for me. And I try to sample a portion of it, right? Um, so we'll be going over some of this stuff in Photoshop module next week. There's lots of resources at your disposal. Um, particularly if you want to start to think about um, particular materials, right? So in this case, wood, I'm thinking about warmth, a little bit of texture, some sort of cadence when it comes to the sort of joints in between these slabs of wood. Uh, I'm trying to bring something that could be kind of a large ceiling in this case um, down to sort of a human scale. And you can even imagine maybe removing every so often a piece of wood and putting a little conce uh, a concealed uh, recess that. Uh, uh, what do you call those? The, the lights, uh, fluorescent lights or something, right? So it all looks like it's sort of integrated and built in together as some sort of cohesive material system that looks like, you know, beautiful, right? So anyway, uh, I digress, but um, these are again are, are here. I also added this link. Um, you know, I, I can never remember all of the pages for three scaled human figures and, and apparently llamas. And, other pachyderm, but anyway, uh, so I just go, I just always Google Arch Daily free um, scaled figures, and then it brings me to this page. And there's like 13 different pages of different human figures and of different kinds and types, and um, you know, vantage points. Some of them are from up above or from down below, some of them are at eye level, etc. So, um, some of them are of crowds, so that can come in handy when you really want to populate and activate a space in your rendering, right? But if you think about a perspective, a good perspective is telling a story, right? It's telling a story. And oftentimes, if you want to convince us that this is a space that actually can be populated, you populate with lots of scale figures, right? You can begin to talk about the scale of the space. You can talk about um, programmatic uses of the space. You begin to talk about uh, uh, how great the space is when people are holding balloons and popsicles and running around and, and uh, playing the guitar and things like that. Right? So on and on and on. Right, you can begin to tell a story, right? There's cars, there's trees, there's other things in here. Right, so without any further ado, let's just open up Rhino and get to work. Sorry, I have to open up Windows first. I thought I had that going. It won't take long for Windows to fire up, hopefully. It's actually relatively quick now. It used to take forever. You'd wait, wait forever for the system tray icons to load down at the bottom, and oh, it's such a pain. What a pain. I think they, they finally caught on that people don't like that. All those add-ons that the companies try to load over top of your Windows build. That's a really pretty picture, like Santorini or something. All right. Wherever, wherever that is, I want to go there for vacation as soon as possible. We have a double negative this weekend. You guys ever heard of double negative? Land art? Anybody interested in land art or heard of Michael Heiser? You have. Yeah. Are you going? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine an artist and the canvas is not a piece of canvas or a 
piece of metal or something you can make a sculpture of against the landscape and you start to move dirt around or um, that's you got land art in this case let me just open up Rhino 7 while well, that's running this looks ridiculously too large I wonder why it's doing that view display settings 150 why would I want it at 150% that's just stupid you think I'm that old I can't see all right there we go I'm the one that likes like size 6 What these stupid icons that are like going out the screen. That's not Name the file to open. There we go. All right, so. Again, I feel like Martha Stewart up here. It's like a cooking show, right? So, like, you know, we have this, and then we put it in the oven, and we take something out of the oven, and it's been cooking for 440 minutes or something. Just wait. All right, there we are. All right, so in this case, I took my perspective view. I uh, rearranged some things around my screen to make it a lot larger, right? Um, right now, it'll tell me the viewport dimensions my rear set is over here in this box. 849 by 593, which is not that large. Honestly. Oh, no, that's sorry, that's the perspective view. Let's see what the perspective view is. 1283 by 1170, which again isn't that large, honestly. Right, so the first thing I'm going to tell you right now is that when we're talking about these base renderings that we're doing over the weekend, I want them to be 12 inches by 12 inches, like 300 dpi. So what does that mean? 12 inches by 12 inches at 300 dpi. This is my note to myself to not forget to record the lecture today. Um, right, so if we think about this, 12 by 12. Right? What's the DPI stand for? Shots per inch, right? That's right there. Like chicken scratch. So if we want to size this, what we can say is instead of doing it 12 by 12 and saying 300 DPI, we could say 3600 pixels by 3600 pixels, right? That's the size that we want. Right? We can set that in multiple places as we capture. Um, from a viewport, and as we save JPEG or PNG from a render, from a render setting, something like that. So keep that in mind, right? Now this might be, uh, you know, it might show up larger. And we scale down to 12 by 12 in, in InDesign, right, or Illustrator. It'll be at 300 dpi. That's the key. We want 300 dpi minimum for printing. It's just good habit, okay? So these are the constraints. 12 inches by 12 inches. Inside each of those inches, 300 dots by 300 dots. You divide that up in a grid, 300 cells by 300 cells, right? That's a lot of information, isn't it? Each one of those are assigned color value. When we zoom out, suddenly it looks like an image, right? Right. Um, and so if you think about that 12 by 12 field, then it's 3,600 pixels by 3,600 pixels, right? I don't know what the square of 3,600 is, but it's, it's large. It's a lot of, a lot of stuff. All right. So. Let's get going now. So there's a few things you might notice here. One is that I need to switch over back to the laptop. Yeah, there we go. That would help. I'll try to act a little smarter for the rest of the lecture. Right, I have this sort of brown wood stuff on the softness, right? I'm not really happy with that. It's not really what I was going for. Um, and I really wasn't impressed with all the materials that Rhino was using. Um, but I'm going, going to start to, to add some shaders to this model anyway, even if I don't really care for them, just so we can see how that works, right? And you can start to add and pick and choose what you'd like, right? Your opinion might be different. You might be like, that is gorgeous. That looks like dark mahogany wood, um, you know, and I, I really kind of dig that. And Josh, I think you're stupid for not liking that. I mean, that's fine. Just don't call me stupid. Um, but, you know, everybody has their own opinion about these things. So. Over here on this, on where I have this, all this stuff about the stuff about the properties, the layers, render settings now, and also you can see a paint tube, right? And that is the materials. Now, if you don't see the render settings, the materials, uh, editors, and things like that over here, you can always go to the render pull down menu. 
right? And you'll see that there's a material editor, an environment editor. Um, there's the render properties down here, right? Those will bring them up in floating boxes. If you prefer to keep them in floating boxes and turn them off and on as you want, go for it. But if there's a floating box over here, you click and drag it over to the right, you can dock it in here and it's one of those tabs, right? That's what I've done. All right, you can see that there's some materials I've already added here. There's tile square pavers, there's terrazzo gray polished, there's a large paver, tile two, African teak, which is a wood, teak wood, African teak polished, ash, polished, polished ash wood, bamboo, African teak, teak, there's a variety here of stuff that's been polished and not polished, matte aluminum, gray glass, I was experimenting with some things, matte steel, white matte paint. All right, so. Let's just assume that we have none of these up here. I'll just go ahead and delete these. I guess these are the ones I'm actually using. Delete. Yeah, I no, I accidentally hit delete three times. Come on, yes. Don't you hate it when it comes up that? Are you sure you wanna delete them? It's like, well, I went to pretty extraordinary measures too, so it'd be helpful if you did delete it, please. All right, delete, sorry. A good craftsman never blames his crappy tools, right? All right, so um, this is my, maybe what yours looks like, right? By default, a lot of this stuff is just generic white plaster clay. Um, and so what we can do, is, and sometimes I like that, right? Other times I want to be very specific. You'll see this plus sign, I can click here, right? There's several options. The work with material library, create a physically based material protection file, right? You know what type of you're doing. Um, you use either of those. There's also a list of stuff here: custom double-sided emission, gem, glass, metal paint, physically based picture plastic. More types, right? Um, so if I just go with like plastic, what's going to do is it's going to give me the most generic plastic shader ever, and then I have the properties for it down here. So I can rename this and save it a different type of plastic, change its color. Let's say, uh, you know. Glossy plastic in here kind of looks like glossy car paint. I don't know. Um, so we'll do that particularly gross melon color. You can change its reflectivity, transparency, um, some other settings here. You can add a bump texture map if you'd like, right? Um, but for the most part, you know, you get what you get, right? Um, and there aren't too many surprises. Let's see what happens if I just, uh, so I have this soffit selected, right? You can see it, in, it's the wireframe of it is, is Highlighted magenta. Um, and so with that selected, I can come over to the shader and I can say assign to the objects that are selected, assigned objects, right? You can see the change. So that's basically how you do things. So at a certain point, you might begin to remember that you kept certain things on different layers. You can always select things, objects on one layer, you know, like the ceilings, right? And set all those to wood all the time, right? Or whatever it is, right? Um, you know, that great useful. Uh, grid ceiling or whatever it is that you really floats your boat. Another way of doing this is saying import from material library. That brings up a folder directory with lots of different, a lot of the same sort of similar categories that we saw down there. Um, but then we can go around and start to um, see what's in here. So you can see that there's African teak, African teak, um, ash, avadir, bamboo, beech, you know, there's probably some maple, some oak, some poplar, et cetera, right? Um, all kinds of stuff, more than I ever cared to. Then you can see that there's also specialty things. Walnuts, for some reason, has its own directory because there's lots of different types of walnuts, I guess. Um, there's burl. You guys know what burl, burl means? Sort of really expressive grain that comes out from the lid sometimes, where it looks really super curvy, and there's a lot of uh, uh, contrast between the different uh, layers of grain. So burly grain. Um, oftentimes, uh, carpenters love that because, um, you know, again, you express the properties of that material in a really sort of gorgeous way, right? Um, where you start to see the, the properties of the tree that um, yielded the wood, etc. cetera. Um, cork, oak, all kinds of things, right? Let's go with bamboo, why not? Um, so in this case, I'll just sort of say assigned object. That should turn to bamboo. Now, I'm not that happy with that bamboo. It doesn't look so nice. It's like the opposite of nice, right? Like when I think about bamboo, there's like a texture, there's a grain. 
particularly it's been laminated together, it looks like that there's this particular, uh, I just don't see coming out here, right? So, you know, in, in some cases I'll, I can leave this. Um, in other cases, I might want to get rid of it. If I want to make certain walls painted certain colors, right, I can begin to do that. Let's, um, let's add material, import from material library. Let's go with architecture, wall, um, CMU, 